Hi guys, so this is Tensor from the Tensor Programming blog. Uh, I thought I'd break in our YouTube channel by making a video about Node.js and about the various options you have as a programmer for text editors and for IDEs. Um, I believe that this is a very important choice for any programmer to make, whether you're beginner or advanced, uh, making choice for text editor or at least a development environment in general um, you know certain people like certain things not everybody loves Emacs not everybody likes them you know um, and there are a lot of different choices nowadays which are all equally great for different people of course um, and for different situations so but before all that, we're going to talk about Node.js. So Node.js essentially is a JavaScript runtime that was built on the uh, Chrome browser engine, which is the Chrome V8 JavaScript engine. Um, more or less, it is a JavaScript server that is coupled with a uh, package manager called NPM. And this package manager is extremely powerful, right? So even if you don't plan to deal with JavaScript, um, it's something that you're going to have to deal with at some point. Like if you're doing Ruby on Rails, you need NPM. If you're doing uh, to do bundle exec, you need an NPM to install your JavaScript libraries. If you're working with Django and Python, you need NPM at some point. If you're working with, you know, just any language really, and Golang has NPM, you know, binded packages uh, you know if you want to work with react and ohm on closure you're going to eventually need npm uh, so yeah as well as linogen but npm is probably the strongest package manager for you know any single language at least out there currently so okay npm or node is available for uh, you know every um, every os uh, I recommend if you're going to install it, you install the uh, LTS version, which stands for uh, long-term release or long-term schedule release or long-term support. Sorry, <laughs> I'll cut that out. So yeah, I recommend that you install the LTS, which stands for long-term support. Uh, the LTS version, basically what they do is they freeze the version after a certain period of time. And then they only give it bug updates while they continue with their beta software, which is the current software. And then after a certain period of time, they'll freeze the current channel, move it over to the LTS channel, and continue to update the current channel with the newest stuff. So the LTS, while it does say 4.6 versus 6.7, you have access to any anything and everything that's on Node, okay? You're not going to lose out by installing the LTS, and it's much more stable than the current version. So in most cases, you install the LTS version, okay? They have, okay, so they have a Windows installer, which is an MSI. They have a Macintosh installer. Um, they have various Linux binaries. You can install it from source. If you're going to do it from source, though, you need uh, Python 2.7 or 8. Um, uh, if you are on Linux, though, you can get uh, Node through your package managers. I know Debian has it on their apt-get or on their synaptic package manager. I know that you can get it through Pac-Man on Arch Linux. And um, you know, right here they have the ARM packages so that you can get it on Fedora and you can get it on um, OpenSUSE. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very easy to get. Uh, package and it's it's very strong it's worth it's worth your time it's worth installing and it's worth looking into it's not very difficult to figure out how to work it at least not the package manager node is another thing and we'll get to that at some point on the blog but um, for now it's it's worth installing even if you don't plan to touch JavaScript okay so now let's talk about text editors the first one we're gonna look at is None other than GUN Emacs. Emacs for short. Emacs has been around since I believe it was 1986 or 7. So it's almost like 45, 46 years old. I mean, it's a crazy old piece of software. When Emacs came out, um, 
you got to remember that not many computers had peripherals like mice okay so the goal of Emacs was to allow people to basically navigate the screen of their computer as quick as possible with just a keyboard and that's what it does so in you know of course it's got a very steep learning curve and you you have to learn all the shortcuts and the, you know how it works like how the buffering system works and how you can copy and paste and stuff like that but after you learn it it is more than worth it and it is probably in my opinion at least and i'm a pretty old programmer myself it is the best editor for any language period just straight up because you also have access to vim mode evil mode you know you can use vim shortcuts you can use your emacs shortcuts you can customize the shortcuts you have access to thousands and thousands of packages it's it's a great thing and you also have it also has a built-in lisp uh, called elisp which is a version i believe of common lisp which is just very easy to use very easy to configure it's a great little piece of software the next one we're going to talk about is vim which is yet another old uh, piece of software. If you're running Linux, you probably already have Vim installed. Uh, Vim and VI are the two versions. And they've been around almost as long as Linux has. Um, again, like Emacs, uh, basically they came out when people didn't really have mice. You know, uh, I believe, actually, I believe Vim came out after mice were invented, but, um, you know, not everybody had a mouse. And so, of course, the object of Vim basically was to make it so that you don't have to type as many keystrokes and you would get, you know, the same thing. So, and that's why, like, for example, Emacs has its own built-in Vim keys because Vim is a very powerful set of key, you know, keyboard shortcuts built into it. It also has an extremely great community and there's thousands of packages like Emacs. Um, it is a little difficult to learn, but once you learn it again, like Emacs, it pays back in dividends. Okay, and even if you choose one of these other uh, package managers, I'm a, or not package managers, text editors that I'm about to talk about, you should consider installing Vim mode on them. Because let me tell you, once you learn Vim, or if you learn Emacs, or if you learn both, you can navigate your screen faster than if you were using a mouse and keyboard with just your keyboard which is something okay so the next one we're going to talk about is sublime text and comparative to both emacs and vim it's quite young but it's quite well tested it's a good piece of software it's very lightweight um, technically it's not open source uh, and there's a paid version but you can use it indefinitely without paying a dime um, it's supported on most Linux distributions, it's supported on OS X, and it's supported on Windows. Uh, there's Sublime Text 2 and Sublime Text 3. Uh, there's no real downside to downloading 3 right now. Technically, it's still a beta build, but um, I don't know. It, it's 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 at the point where it's it's more or less fine, and it's well established. There are thousands of different packages. Um, Sublime Text does have one little caveat that you probably have to get over, and that is installing the package manager. You have to do it um, manually just by, you just copy and paste a bit of code into the console and it will do it for you. It's not that difficult. Um, <clears throat> but that aside, it's, it's a great little piece of software. It's great for machines that can't handle the other text editors on this list. Um, or you know, for people who don't want Vim or Emacs. So the next one is Atom, and Atom was is an open source text editor that was created by GitHub. Uh, if you know anything about programming, then you know what GitHub is. And Atom is great because it it was built on the Node.js. Um, it was built on Node.js. It has a built-in uh, JavaScript console. It's got tons of themes, tons of plugins. It's a little bit more heavy duty than Sublime Text. Uh, and I've had a few problems with it on Windows 10, but on Linux and on Mac, it's perfectly stable. 
and it's great, and it supports all kinds of different languages. Um, and like Sublime Text, like Emacs, it has tons of packages, it has a great community, uh, it has a Vim mode as well. It is a great little package or text editor, and it has its own package manager called APM. Um, yeah, it's it's really a nice piece of software. Uh, I would use it myself um, if I didn't like Emacs so much, but I still do use it for some things. But uh, I don't use it as much as I should, I think. So. The next one is the Adobe edition, which is brackets. The way I look at brackets, I have it open here and I'll show you here in a second. The way I look at brackets is it's a, it's basically a what you see is what you can get type editor. So it's like Dreamweaver, but very cut down and smaller. And it's more geared towards coding. So here, as you can see, I have a few JavaScript and TypeScript applications open. Um, you know, this one, I assure you it works, even though it's throwing all these red flags. It works, the code's fine. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's a good little text editor for people who want to work on, um, on web technologies, okay? Because a lot of it is based around the live preview feature and um, you know which is like Dreamweaver you can live preview what you're building you know as you're building it so like for example this is a little to-do app that I wrote a long time ago and um, you know if I hit live preview it pops up with to-dos and I can type in stuff so like and you know and it's showing me a live preview with the JavaScript running and that's because it has a built-in JavaScript console as you can see here, it's it's built on Node as well, like Atom. But instead of, I don't think it was built in CoffeeScript like Atom. I think it was just built in JavaScript. So here, you know, it's like a browser. It's got a console and everything. So it's pretty nice. <clears throat> okay. So the next one is a bit of an older uh, standard, and that's Notepad++. Notepad++ has a great community. It's very lightweight very stable, um, cross-platform, you know, has tons of packages. Uh, it's not very flashy. You won't get like crazy themes or anything. And, you know, but it gets the job done. And tons of people have been using this for years now. It's older than the other three that we've talked about, aside from Vim and Emacs, which are older than it. But it's basically the third oldest on this list, I'd say. <clears throat> And it's, it's a good one. It's, it is. Uh, if you don't like Atom, if you don't like Sublime Text, you don't like Emacs, you don't like Vim, you don't like Brackets, then definitely go with Notepad++. Um, the next one is Visual Studio Code, which is Microsoft's uh, entry. And it's funny because Visual Studio Code, Brackets, and Atom, they all kind of came out around the same time. And they all tried to corner the same market. I like Visual Studio Code. I have it open here. This is an F-sharp program that I was writing. Just a little uh, fun little cipher. It's basically emulating the uh, Enigma cipher from World War uh, II. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's just a little program, whatever, who cares, you know. But I can open anything. I can open Elm in this. I can open, you know, C-sharp. I can open C. Uh, there's nothing in that C app. I can open Haskell, JavaScript, you know, whatever, and it works fine. And that's because of the package manager, as you can see here. If I click this, it shows me all the packages. I can update the ones that are, you know, currently need updating. Um, it's got Git integration, so here's Git right here. Uh, it's got a built-in debug, and it's got intelligent uh, IntelliSense like uh, Visual Studio, uh, the full IDE does. <clears throat> now that's something else to consider. You could also get Visual Studio. It's now cross-platform. just happened, I guess, about six months ago. They started making both of these more cross-platform. I'd say if you're not on Windows, hold off on getting Visual Studio code because it's not as stable on other platforms as it is on Windows. 
but it's still a very good package or uh, text editor. I don't know why I keep saying package manager. I guess it's because they all have package managers built into them. All right, so now we're going to get into the IDEs, and there are really two main IDEs I want to talk about. I know I just closed the third window, but I really don't know much about Komodo IDE. It's another one you can think about, but I don't know much about it, so I can't really talk about it. The first one we're going to talk about is Eclipse. Now, Eclipse is great because there are all kinds of different flavors of it. You can get a Scala Eclipse, you can get a Clojure Eclipse, you can get a uh, Java Eclipse, JavaScript Eclipse, you can get a Dart Eclipse, anything you want, anything you're programming in. I'm sure there's a version of Eclipse for it. It's got tons of plugins, tons of themes. It's a full-on IDE. It also has cloud support with Eclipse Chi, and you can do a lot with it. It's very powerful, and the best thing about it is that you can install multiple different variants of it without having them conflict with one another on your system. So it's really nice, and it's very easy to package it up, put it on like a USB drive and take it with you. And for an IDE, that's a big deal, um, because it, it doesn't have many, I guess you could say, roots or bindings into the OS, so it's, it's great in that way. <clears throat> uh, I'd say the only real downside is that it's an IDE. It's, uh, you know, and it was most, mostly built for Java originally. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's got a huge community and it's open source. So even the, you know, for example, the Erlang version of Eclipse is, it's supported by its own community and it's pretty stable. So, and the last one we're going to talk about is IntelliJ, which is basically IntelliJ, they created Android Studio, which is the huge Android, uh, Java IDE that's being used by Google right now. Uh, if you want to make anything on Android, you either use Eclipse or you use Android Studio. <clears throat> um, but they also have various different versions of it. So IntelliJ IDEA is their Java platform, but that also supports Scala, Enclosure, and any JVM language, really. <clears throat> they also have their own JVM language. Kotlin, I believe it's called. I've never really programmed with it, but if you want to give it a spin, you can. They have PyCharm, they have PHP Storm, so they support PHP, Python, Ruby, WebStorm, which supports JavaScript, Dart, TypeScript, Elm. Uh, I believe they have an Elixir plugin, an you know, Erlang plugin, a Haskell plugin. Uh, they have a Swift, here's a Swift IDE, and it has Objective C built into it, um, C in C, an SQL IDE and a C-sharp IDE. All these are basically built on the same platform. So if you download the IntelliJ uh, IDEA platform, you will gain access to most of the other ones as well. <clears throat> it's free to use. Uh, they do have a paid version, which gives you a lot more. But if you're just, you know, messing around, if you're just starting coding, you don't really need, you know, all this stuff like the Perforce and the clear case. You know, you don't need all of it. Uh, it says here TypeScript and stuff, but you can download the, you know, the web version and it, it works fine. So, um, yeah, these are great IDEs. They're worth looking at, you know, and they're professional, professional grade IDEs. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time.